Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome back to the Top Flight Pod. You know what it is. You know what we're here to do. Back on screen today, beautiful Austin, Texas. I'm your host, Hernan. You can call me H. Tonight, I'm joined by my G, Neftali Ochoa. You can call him Nef, but I'll let him introduce himself. Nef, how are you doing tonight, bro? Welcome to the show once again. Well, thanks for having me once again uh, on here. Uh, happy to come and talk some some Austin FC, some maybe some Europe later on, but it's a, it's a great weather today. So it's Beautiful, beautiful day in Austin. You know, we, we mentioned Europe, bro. A lot of stuff happened across the pond. We had probably the robbery of the century in the Real Madrid versus uh, Valencia game, something that even Pat McAfee, a NFL, NBA commentator, he even said MLS would never let something like that happen. Uh, but it, it, it didn't stop there. I mean, that made the rounds, you know. It wasn't just La Liga. It wasn't just in Europe. It made it all the way back to the United States. You know, also you had the Manchester Derby go on today. You had uh, Man City absolutely thumped Man United, making Manchester blue. But, of course, you know, we got to start off with Austin FC because they got a valuable point in Seattle at Lumen Field. Now, there was a lot of conversation Nev, yesterday on social media about how to go about this point. Is it valuable? Is it... Is it, I guess some fans were calling it a bit of an embarrassing performance, but that's what we're here for, for tonight. We're going to talk about it, and I'm excited to get into the show. But before we do get into it, I want to send a special shout out to everybody on the uh, Discord, all of our Patreon members. Thank you for the support in this season uh, that we're going to about to embark pretty much. We already started off with it, but it feels like it's going to be a long one. And just once again, shout out to everybody that's on Patreon and, and on Discord. The conversations on there are Absolutely fun. And the fantasy footy league that we have on there, it's a hundred dollar pot for the winner. So we'll see who it goes to. Currently I'm in first place, but there's matches that need to be played. And I think I'm going to fall to about third place because I'm only in the lead by two points. Now, before everybody says that it's rigged, just know I'm not the admin. I didn't organize the league. I just put the prize out there. So whoever wins it, you'll get a hundred bucks. Hopefully it's me. So I can get myself a nice little, I don't know, a nice new hat from the Austin FC store. I don't know. Maybe, maybe two beers because the prices have gone up, but Nef, let's get into the show, bro. Now it was a little bit difficult to, to think about where we're going to start off tonight's match. Sorry, tonight's uh, pod, because there was some media availability with Alex ring and Josh Wolf midweek where, you know, Josh Wolf kind of gave us a timeline on Sebastian Drusi and uh, Lil Weissman, or maybe not really a timeline on Drusi, but he gave us a little bit more of an update. You know, he said that he was going to be out. Uh, well, he was a questionable for Seattle. You know, he says that he hopes that he gets him back soon. And then we hear him say about Lil Weissman that he, he'll he be out four to eight weeks. Now, before we heard that from Wolf officially, we saw a post from Cap City Soccer, shout out to them to do great work, where they came out and they said how Lil Weissman was going to be out four to eight weeks. Now, I think that was a bit of an estimate based off what plantar fasciitis is. Uh, but later on, we did get confirmation from Coach Wolf himself that Gaffer saying he'll be out for around two months. So, Nef, you know, we don't want to spend too much time on the media availability. It's just a real recap. But what did you get from the words that you heard from, you know, Coach Wolf and uh, also Alex Ring, who was very, he was he was very real, very open about their performance against Minnesota. He pretty much took all ownership of that, you know, saying that they gave away the first half and they can't win a game when they give away 45 minutes like that. But I ask you again, uh, what was your thoughts on the words that we heard from those two guys midweek? Oh, I think I think especially uh, going into the Seattle game and what it turned into, I think it was a bit of of a mismatch of of, of sorts. I mean, Ring talking the way that he did, and then the game the way that it was performed against Seattle, I think it left a lot to be desired. Uh, and and just like like we've talked about before the season started, it's just what these guys say. It we've got to take it with a grain of the moment until result results start coming in because words at this point words really don't mean much. Hmm. Well, you know words are words are are one thing, Neff, and what you do on the pitch is something else. Now we heard from Josh Wall from Alex from what they had to say and. And really, it's kind of building up into, you know, the Seattle game that we're about to get into. But before we unpack what happened in the match, I do want to talk about the short-term agreements, Neff, that were announced uh, the morning before the game. Now, we do we, we get the an announcement from Austin FC, the communications department, saying that Valentin Noel, Antonio Gomez, and Salvatore Mazzaferro have all been signed to a short-term agreement for Austin FC, of course, ahead of the match against Seattle. Now... 
there was some people asking like, hey, well, what does this mean? You know, what what does this exactly mean for, for the boys? And then, you know, on the Instagram caption for the post that we put out, Neff, I'm going to read what is pretty much from the MLS regulations. You know, they say, per the 2024 MLS roster rules and regulations, a club may sign a player aged 25 or younger from its MLS Next Pro team to a max of four short-term agreements up to four-day contracts each season, a maximum of 16 total days. An individual player may be included on up to four MLS League season match rosters each season. However, that player may appear in no more than two MLS League season matches. An individual player may appear in a number of non-league games during the terms of this four short-term agreements. So we get that, that bit of information there from the league. And it, whenever that was announced, Neff, there was a lot of fans that were very excited, especially for a guy like Valentino Noel, who I thought was the only name of the three that could possibly sniff out some minutes against Seattle based off of the position that he that he plays in and obviously Drusy being out that that 10 spot we see Valentino well with three goals in preseason of course it is against certain opponents now you're in league play and things get real but I was really thinking that Valentino well was going to sniff out some minutes against Seattle but uh the when the official lineup came out which we're going to talk about here in a bit we see that one of those names was left off and it was Salvatore Mezzaferro I was a bit of a surprise. Personally, I would have fancied Salvatore over Antonio Gomez, who was in the lineup with Valentino Noel. But I wonder if maybe last minute Salvatore maybe had a problem, you know, maybe a little bit of a knock or whatever. But anyways, he was left off of that team sheet and it was only Antonio Gomez and Valentino Noel. So, Nef, I want to get your thoughts on the short-term agreements. Of course, you know, you're a big uh, Valentino uh, Noel guy. And maybe you see the, you know, the... You may, or maybe you saw the reason why I thought Valentino was going to get some minutes based off of how he's been performing with the team in preseason. But what did you think when you saw the announcement from Austin FC that these three guys were going to be signed on the short-term agreement? Well, the the initial uh, thought, you know, I just I hope they they better get some minutes, you know, because it's it's almost I don't know if the word is disrespectful, but it definitely brings their hopes up of them being able to get minutes. I mean, it's one thing if they're constantly on the first team roster and they're just not getting called up, but it's another thing to get called up and then you're just there for nothing. And and I and I mean, I can only imagine what it feels like as a professional player to to get excited and and you're you're just there as a placeholder. I think it it must be it must be hard. I I don't I personally don't like. Uh, how those contracts are being because you only get four of those per season. Well, I mean, I mean also per, 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 per player per season, I think. Yeah, yeah, the, the terminology on that is very interesting. You need a master's degree in MLS to really understand what's going on. But what I wanted to say, Neff, is, is I want you know I feel like whenever you're a young guy, you know, you're in the supplemental area, you know, I feel like this 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 comes with it, right? And it could be you know them them getting their their hopes up, especially for Valentino L, which. It's that international roster spot that's holding him back from being signed on, onto this team. But uh, I, I feel like, you know, whenever you're a young player coming into a team like Austin, you know, in Major League Soccer, sometimes things like this are going to happen. It's just part of being a young player, although Valentino is incredibly talented. I don't know if it's unfair. I think, like, just like I said, I think it just comes with it, Neff. But uh, I really wanted to see Valentino get minutes. I was very sad that he did it. But, hey, we just move forward from there. Now, anything else you want to add, brother, on that topic before we get into the injury report? The the only thing is, you know, the especially in, in Noel's case, he they're not – I always, I feel like you're speaking about, like, 19, 18, 17-year-olds. Yeah. That, and that's not the case. I mean, for a player like like Valentin Noel, he, he really should be already on a first-team roster consistently. And mm – -hmm. Honestly, I think he has the qualities and capabilities to do so. And I almost feel like his talent is being wasted here. Mm, interesting, mate. I think a lot of people that are listening to this pod would agree with you on that. And the fact that Valentino Will's talent, you know, he's 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 not, just like you said, he's not an 18-year-old kid anymore. He's not a 19-year-old kid anymore. He's in his 20s, right? So, you know, he's out of college. He had a great time where he go to Pitt or something like that with uh, Jackson Bolte, who is probably his number one fan. He's always quote-tweeting him and saying, why hasn't he been signed? Why haven't you picked him up, Austin MC? So everybody get a friend like Jackson Walty. Everybody meets somebody like that in, in their corner. But uh, we go back to Valentino Well. You know, this guy's very talented. He was the MVP in the final for the MLS Next Pro. 
you know, you know what he brings to the table. You know how, the, how he's been performing in preseason. But the fact that that international roster spot is holding him back, it really just gets me upset because Austin MC is pretty much saying like, hey, we know you're good, but we don't think you're that good to give you an international roster spot. And I see what you're saying, Nick, where that can be a little bit disrespectful. And hey, why should he wait until Austin MC decides that they're what they want to give him that international roster spot? And he could be hitting, you know, hit, hit the road soon. And I would understand him 100%. Especially the way the team is performing. I mean, oh, if yes. what you have is not working, why not try something new with new players? Mm-hmm. Agree, agree. Now, with the uh, with other two boys, Gomez and Mazzaferro, you know, it'll be a little bit harder for them to get on the field because you have Cascante, uh, you have Matt Hedge, it's not and is injured, of course, but they have ranks ranks to go through for in this inner center back position. Now, uh, I want to move forward enough to the injury report for Austin FC ahead of the Seattle Sounders match because. Although for Seattle, it was lengthy. It was eight players that they had out. I read, I'll read those names here in a bit. I want to start off with Austin's because although ours only had three names, two of them were for injury, they really, really hurt us in this game, especially Sebastian Drusi. Now, who are we talking about? We're talking about Leo Weissen. Of course, he had the plantar fasciitis out four to eight weeks, around two months is what we were told. We also had Brendan Heinzeich, who had no injury, but I think Wolf said for personal reasons, Brendan, he- Brendan Heinzeich was uh, not playing against uh, Seattle. He was out 100%. And then, of course, the main man, the Austin Talisman, the captain, the main DP, El Crack, Drusy Dior, he's out again. He was out against Minnesota, the home opener. We saw what happened there. He's out against uh, Seattle. We see what happened there as well. Um, he's out for a hamstring injury. Now, he's, he was questionable for Seattle. You and I knew that he wasn't going to play. You know, he, I felt like uh, early on, uh, it was kind of obvious that he didn't even travel with the team based on what the, was being posted on social media by the club. But later on, we get a post from himself watching the team into the comfort of his own home. And, uh, you know, you see the team sheet come out. No Drusy on the starting lineup, no Drusy even on the bench. So, of course, you know, he stayed home and tried to rehab that hammy. Um, so, if we can get into the injury report just a little bit, Neff, you know, Lil Bisonin, a guy that is a very expensive center back, was an expensive signing for Austin FC when he arrived. But I feel like his position was filled in by the partnership of Matt Hedges and Julio Cascante, right? So, there was no worries there. You know, get, get well soon, Lil, of course, 100%. But I'm comfortable right now with what we see in Hedges and Cascante. But what I want to really dissect a little bit is the absence of Sebastian Drusi. Because we saw what happened against Minnesota. Seattle Sounders, the game that just happened, we saw how poor we were moving forward without Drusi. Just, you know, how how do you think this team needs to react moving forward if we don't have him against the likes of St. Louis, mate? Well, I, I'll start off by saying I don't think the, ch- the team changes too much. Drusy on the field, uh, primarily because the team itself has been functioning very pretty much the same as last season. Uh, from from uh, from any tactical point that you want to look at it, there hasn't been much of any change. And the only real difference I see with Drusy being on the field would be them being able to move forward a little more and actually getting shots in. Uh, mm-hmm on target rather than having to wait 60 70 minutes to be able to make to make that first one now and the reason being and and we'll dissect it more when we talk about the uh, game itself but you you notice how uh diego rubio often had to come down to that 10 spot even lower uh to to try to get the ball to put in pressure and and that that's where juicy is going to be and that's the function that he's going to have so other than that i just i don't see i don't see the team changing much in in that aspect now my my main problem with drucy being out and is we don't have a guy to put in for him for him like just name for name right position for position you could try to put danny in there and you know what said you you could put noel you could but i don't think he'll give you what drucy does you know what i'm saying like noel's noel but he's not a drucy but he could be if you give him that opportunity. He needs a chance. I, I'll, I'll let you answer to that, right? But just where, where I'm stuck at right now is the fact that we looked flat, maybe not interested how Bali says, and may, maybe we have all the interest in the world. Maybe we have all the energy to try to get downfield. But it seems as if without Sebastian Drusi, this team's clock does not tick. And we better hope as fans and as media 
that Sebastian Drussi is back as soon as possible because without him, there's nothing to really cover on this team. I mean, we had no shots, no highlights for Austin FC. So moving forward, when we talk about Seattle, we're really just going to dissect the lineup because without Drussi, I mean, what is it to really talk about? So I'll let you uh, respond to what you were going to say, mate. I'm sure it's on the uh, Noel point. Yeah, I mean, and it's really more on the Drusy point. It's you're not gonna find a player like Drusy in this market right now of that of those mm. same type of qualities. And yes, Noel is not that type, but he, as as per the position, Noel is probably the one that's better able to give you, you know, that versatility, that moving forward. He's the one that has those qualities. Uh, hmm. Danny could it's also an option but the problem with having Danny is that he's so used to playing back that he he needs time to also adapt almost again to that role you know he he said it himself I mean he's he's been doing it for three years he's been playing uh more defensive he he needs time up front to be able to produce up front numbers now, Neff, I feel like we're spilling in a little bit into the game against Seattle, so we'll just roll right into it, bro. You know, nil-nil against the Seattle Sounders away from home, the first road match of the 2024 season for us in FC. Now, there was a lot of conversation around this game, Neff. Uh, we had a, an hour Twitter space after the match. It was very late, but the people were still on there. I believe the count went up to maybe 120 live listeners at one point. Last time I checked a couple hours ago. It was at like 500 replays or something like that. So people really wanted to talk about Austin FC after that match. Now, it wasn't just fans. Uh, if you if you were watching along in the Spanish broadcast, they were very critical of Austin FC. Now, it was a night and day to the coverage that Austin was getting in English, uh, the one that I was tuning into. But shout out to Michelle, Sh- Michelle Sanchez, Austin FC uh, reporter. Uh, she was mentioning how pretty much the Spanish commentators were just tearing up Austin FC for kind of being spectators in the match, not registering a single shot until the 70th minute. And then when the when the shot was registered, they had a laugh about it. They said, wow, that registered as a shot? They had a bit of a laugh at the shot that Austin FC had in the 70th minute. So we get into the line of Neff. It was a 4-3-3. That's what the graphic was showing on the MLS Apple TV. We had an in goal Brad Stuber, which Neff, I don't know where this team would be without Brad Stuber. I mean, what a keeper. Underrated guy in the league for sure. Uh, moving forward on defense, we had uh, right back John Gallagher, who has been slotting in there for the past two games with Minnesota. And this one, of course, in last season, he, he did a job there. Uh, and center back position, Neff, we had Matt Hedges and Julio Cascante. Of course, they did a fantastic job on the likes of Pedro de la Vega. And also maybe they did a pretty good job on Jordan Morris, although Morris had more looks. Uh, I feel like they ne- they neutralized de la Vega pretty well. You know, he was still doing what he wanted to do. But when it came to being in front of the goal, Cascante had some very interesting uh, shots blocked. He had some very interesting interventions. And also Matt Hedges, I want to send a shout out to him for the goal saving tackle he had on Jordan Morris right in front of the goal. Uh, moving forward, we had uh, Jean Komenich, birthday boy. He is at the left back position. Still looks like he's a little bit groggy getting up to full fitness. Beetle comes on for him later on in the game. In the midfield, it was Alex Ring. Now, Neff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, Alex Ring was at the 8. Danny was more at the 10, but, but they were in a double pivot, it looked like, moving forward. And then Valencia was at the back in that you know classic 5 position or the 6, whatever you want to call it. I call it the destroyer, right? Uh, and then in the attack, we had uh, O'Brien, who's the right wing. Shout out to Khaled O'Brien. He was getting real chippy with Nuhu. They had a little bit of a interesting battle going on there between those two. And Rubio, who was getting very heated, he was pushed. Uh, silly foul was it by Ariaga, where they were on the pretty much on the sideline. They go for the ball, and then Rubio just sorry. Ariaga shoulder checks Rubio, and he sends him into the Seattle bench, just crashing into some of the trainers and bench players that they had on there. Uh, Rubio was very upset. And then we on the left wing, a guy that we're going to talk about here tonight and not in a good way. And it pains me because I'm, I, I really want him to work out. And it's Emiliano Rigoni. Uh, I feel like it just it, it doesn't work when he's on the field, when Sebastian Drussi is also not there. We go back to even in the time when we got to the conference final against LAFC. A lot of people still to this day say that Ethan Finley should have been the player that started at that position. Instead, we had Rigoni. But it's 2024 and we're talking about Seattle. And unfortunately, even though I want to fast forward, it's still a lot of the same from Rigoni. So, Nef, I like this lineup. I thought it was the best we could have put out there without Sebastian Drussi. You know, we had those young players on the bench. Noel was out there, right? 
But based off what we had, I think this was a good 11 to put out there. Of course, they came back home with a point, a very valuable point. We can talk about that here now. But what was your thoughts on the starting 11 that Wolf put out against Seattle? I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with you. the The starting eleven was probably the best that we can put out there. Honestly, yeah. um, I don't think that's where it went wrong. Uh, obviously, and I don't know if you want to go ahead and just get right into the the game as it is. But go ahead. What really what what really went wrong? I feel was the players at, at points looked confused. It seemed like they wanted to do something else, but then just went back to what they were doing. And so I'm not sure that there was a clear tactical um, perspective to this game. I know they, they had to have prepared it. And like you said earlier, I don't think it's that they that they don't have the desire to go out there and win because they're professionals. Of course, they want to go out there and win. But I think that the, I do think that the the confusion and tactics that they're having, the misunderstanding there with with Wolf, I'm going to say, because that's that's you know, the line of uh, order uh, mm-hmm. and who impl- uh, who puts these players on the field. I think that's where the, there is some heavy misunderstanding, a lot of confusion. Uh, and, and it just doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like this team can do much, not only, let alone with Drusy or without, but just on its own, like surviving alone. Like this team can either attack fairly well or it can do what it did against Seattle and defend with its life, but it cannot do both in the same game. And that's that's very, very, very concerning because to be a team that, quote unquote, because the, the way that Josh really wants to set this up is almost as a counterattack team, you can't have that, especially not having any speed whatsoever to counterattack. No. So... Good. Now, on the tactical point that you made, Neff, on the uh, confusion, I agree 100% because we go back to the to the instance that really was kind of silly. You can really just label it as that. When Rigoni was exploding, you know, through the middle of the field, he had just done a cheeky mag that the social media team was apparently celebrating as a highlight reel for Rigoni against Seattle. He gets a mag against Atencio, if I'm not mistaken or um, the other gentleman that was in midfield for Seattle. But, you know, he's going through the midfield. He sees Alex Ring is kind of, you know, running beside him on the right wing. And he lays off a pass that I think was pretty good. It wasn't too bad. It wasn't far away from Alex Ring. It wasn't fast that he couldn't catch up to. And even knew who himself was a fantastic left back. You know, he kind of was given the space for the Austin MC player to receive the ball. He sees that they don't even try. Alex Ring doesn't even try to get the ball. And Seattle collects it right away. But that tells me right away, Neff, that there was two different ideas. One guy wanted to counterattack, and one guy wanted to hold the ball and just wait for everybody to come forward and then create the chance. But that's the, the confusion there that you're, that you're talking about that I agree with 100%. Now, there was another instance at the end of the game that I mentioned in the Twitter space last night when Cascante goes down. And uh, he wants to stay down for the last couple of seconds of the game because, of course, you know, being a center back in that match, you have to be proud of what you did and you have to be proud of, of, of securing that point. But a, an, an attacker like Ethan Finley wants the ball quick to set up the counterattack to maybe get the three points away from home after you didn't deserve them. But the counterattack chance was there. It didn't happen. Two different minds, I think, yesterday for Austin FC. And just going back to the point that you made, I agree 100%. I think there was two different minds. One of them wanted a counterattack, and the other one wanted to just hold the ball, retain it, and play that, you know, quote-unquote wolf ball that everybody likes to mention. Um, but we did also speak with Maiji uh, Shayan from Ray Green TV, and he was saying how, if, to him, it seemed like Austin FC's plan was to just bunker in, protect that box, you know, protect it, pretty much park the bus. Park the bus is what everybody's going to call it. And it seems like it worked. I mean, not seems, it definitely worked. And he was also saying how Austin FC was most likely playing to get a lucky goal or some kind of goal opportunity and, you know, snatch it up and just defend, 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 defend. Could it be that Austin FC executed that plan to perfection? Of course, they didn't get the goal, but they secured a clean sheet and they secured a point away from home. So, Nev, going into that question, I mean, how do you feel about this point? Because there's a lot of discourse on social media right now, a lot of conversation where there's fans not happy with the point, but there's fans that are over the moon with this point. Now, I went on social media and I said, it's okay to be happy with the point, and it's okay to be upset at the attack and display because there was nothing moving forward from Austin FC. 
but it's okay. It is okay. You know, we had Tony say yesterday that we're a very fickle fan base, that we like to argue back and forth, and we're night and day on decisions like this. And I agree with him. I agree with him sometimes. But I just wanted to put out there that it is okay to be cool with the point, but it's also okay to be critical about your team moving forward. I don't think – look, there, there, there's people out there that try to be right 100% of the time, but Austin FC is going to make you look silly because they really just make you go through every emotion in this roller coaster. So it's impossible to be spot on with Austin FC. So, Nef, I go back to the question. I mean, where are you at with this point? Listen, just being not being any type of bias and just being as objective as I can possibly be, this is gold for Austin FC. So, yes, absolutely. You did this, say, this, real quick, real quick, you did say on social media, correct me if I'm wrong, you said Austin FC is about to get very lucky. I said very, did. like, four times because Austin... It, it, that's what it was, and and let's just let's just be clear here. Should Austin FC be happy with the point? Yes, because they shouldn't have had a single point out of that match. Now, hundred percent. Now, here here's where you can look at it, where where I kind of get divided, right? Would I, as a fan, be happy with that? No, because the performance was awful. Like, you can say, oh, the defensive master class, and it, it really wasn't even that. If you really look at it, you wouldn't be saying it's a defensive master class if those four goals go in. You know what I'm saying? It's not like yeah, they stopped yeah. and they, they still allowed somehow 23 shots to go near goal. Not not on target, mm-hmm. all of them, but near goal. Mm-hmm. And and as a team that's structured, you don't allow that on in a regular game. I understand that you know, compared to other defensive uh, uh, performances, this probably looked amazing. But you have to realize that half the team was always, always on Austin's side of the field to to have that happen. Yes. So, no, no. So, so that's that's where I'm like, I don't think it was. I wouldn't be happy with that whatsoever, because no. if my team got a tie. And they they were fighting and missing shots. Okay, that's one thing, mm-hmm. but that that just wasn't the case. Now I don't know if it was a defensive masterclass because for that I feel like the entire defensive unit had to be on the same page. I think Gallagher was maybe the weakest link last night on defense against Seattle. He was being absolutely just terrorized on that side by was it Leo Leo Chu and Pedro de la Vega was also absolutely doing what he wanted when he was uh, healthy. He, he did get injured around the 60 or 70th minute, and Rui Diaz comes on, and we'll talk about what he, his his uh, moment with, with the Seattle team, how it almost made my heart come out of my chest. But, you know, going back to the defense, you know, I, I want to say that it was probably Matt Hedges' best game in an Austin MC jersey. Julio Cascante was definitely the man of the match for me. Uh, some people were saying Stuber, but, you know, Stuber, he had – maybe two fantastic saves. A lot of them were coming at him and a lot of them were being blocked by those guys, Valencia, by Matt Hedges, by Julio Cascante. So I want to give the center backs more credit than Brad Stuber in this game. I know some people are going to give it all to Brad Stuber, but you know, just some quick stats on those two names. Cascante, 90 minutes played, eight clearances, three block shots, 100% aerial duels, and a 7.6 match rating. He was the highest rated player for Austin MC last night. We go to Matt Hedges, 90 minutes played, six clearances, one block shot, Two interceptions and a 7.3 match rating. And then Valencia, uh, who was that destroyer, he had 90 minutes played, 90% pass accuracy, one block shot, three interceptions with a 7.2 match rating. Those were my top performers for Austin FC last night. That triangle that they were forming in front of the goal really stood strong for me, and I want to give them credit. Now, I don't think it was a masterclass, like you said, 100%, but I think it was a monumental performance by those three gentlemen. Now, can they build from it? 100%. I hope they do. But uh, it's 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 not something to get used to. I will say that. It's not something to get used to because we see the kind of mistakes that some of those guys, what I just mentioned, have committed in past matches before. Uh, so hopefully, you know, it is something of the past. Hopefully they say, hey, you know what? Those days are over. Because I, I also put here in my notes, I go back to uh, how we finally saw what Josh Wolf was saying about the emphasis on defense in this game. Right. All preseason, we were hearing how the attack was okay. 
The, the real work had to be on defense. The real work had to be done back there. And against Seattle, mate, you say, you know, it, it wasn't all that of a master of performance. But to me, I was impressed by how those guys stood tall back there on, on defense. Now, of course, John Komenich, John Gallagher, maybe the more weakest link ones. But again, I go back to Hedges, Cascante, Valencia, and, you know, Stuver as my top performers for Austin MC last night. Now, you want any uh, counterpoint in that before we move on to some post-match quotes? Not a counterpoint. But it, more of a co- like comment, mm-hmm. part of why the defense looked as quote-unquote solid as it did, because those mistakes were still there. You just don't remember them as much because there was less mistakes than previous games. And a lot of it had to do with Valencia being there, because that's what Valencia does. He dest- mm-hmm. like, you can't, like you say, he destroys plays before they get okay. to the center backs. Mm-hmm. And that's what you remember. Look, but those mistakes, there's a lot of mistakes in the distribution uh, from coming from the back. Like it still happened. And the proof of that is those 20, 23 shots. Now, with that being said, the team as a whole, I mean, a- Alex, a uh, football critic, you know, shout out to him. He will tell you the first touch that these guys were having, the sequence in playing the link up, it was bad. And if you remember that that game against LA Galaxy in the Coachella Invitational, yes, the you remember 3-1. that. Yes, that for like five minutes they had great link up play, and then everything poof. That's essentially what you've seen again in, in that first game against Minnesota. You see, you saw five minutes where the the, the team linked up great. And same, same thing here, and then boom, disappeared everything. Uh, like it's like, it's just like everything's thrown to the trash. Okay. Now, real quick, uh, some subs that came on before we move on to some uh, match quotes here. We had Zardis, of course, he came on for Rubio at the 66. Finley came on for O'Brien at the 66 as well. Biru Guilherme Biru, the Brazilian left back, he came on for John Komenich. Uh, happy birthday, John, again. That was minute 71 when that substitution took place. And then Owen Wolf, he came off for Danny Pereira at the 86. Owen Wolf picked up a yellow card uh, in the first hole that he committed. And honestly, just real quick, if we could spend a minute on the refereeing from the Seattle game, because although, you know, you, you can't say, oh, it was, it, was, it was because of the referee that we didn't get a goal or blah, 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 or whatever. No, I'm just saying how, how poor the game management was by the referee. I mean, there was at least six or seven unnecessary yellow cards that I counted. But it's not all on the refs. I feel like there was a little bit of a, a little bit of a mindset of you know with the whole situation with the ref, you know the the main core of the refs there on lockout and these replacement refs are are doing the job for now. I feel like there's a lot of coaching staff and players both where they feel like they know more than the guys doing the job right now. And we saw Jean Kolbenich. I mean. I don't know if it's in if if it was in, in in his character before, but I was disappointed with how Jean Komenich just tries to body up or stand up to one of the sideline referees, and he gets an unnecessary yellow card. As a player, you know that you shouldn't do that. That's disrespectful and it's unsportsmanlike. He needs to be smarter than that. Uh, there was also other yellow cards that were flying around uh, for unnecessary uh, moments, in, uh, unnecessary challenges or unnecessary instances in the match, but also the ref was just giving him out like candy. I was very disappointed with the refereeing last night. Uh, not not on calls that they missed, but just how they managed the game. I didn't like it, and I cannot wait until we get Ted Uncle and his partners back because I really miss the old referees right now. Re- just pay them. Give them what they want, honestly, because the referees, they're just getting worse week by week. They started off pretty good in match day one, but I'm just just – didn't like the refereeing display last night. And I don't want to say it's an excuse, but I'm just saying the game management was absolutely atrocious, mate. Anything you want to add on these refs? Uh, I mean, the only thing is, uh, I mean, I hope they get paid, honestly, as well. I, I think uh, I think it's just a, a human decency thing to, you know, support these refs and hope they get paid uh, as they should. Uh, the one thing I will, I'll, will comment on, though, is that there's not too much of a level difference. It's like you, you, you've been watching this league for a while too, and you know that MLS refs, just like these refs, they're a talking point every weekend and every yeah. match there. Yeah. And so I'm not saying 
that it's worth not paying these people because obviously it is. They're professional. They're uh, FIFA licensed uh, officials for a reason. Uh, mm -hmm. But I mean, the level has to go up regardless. And and I don't think it, it refereeing should never be an excuse regardless, unless it's something very bland and obvious. All right. Now, right here, I have the post-match quotes from Coach Wolf and Matt Hedges, who spoke to the media. Shout out to uh, Matt Hedges. It's nice to hear from him because uh, somebody commented or sent us a DM and response to the quote from Hedges, and they were saying how it's nice to hear from him, you know, especially hear something nice from him because it looks like he's always in a bad mood or he's having a bad time. And Hedges does have kind of that face, like, leave me alone. But, you know, he did say something very positive on the team and uh, kind of responded back to Will Bruin on what that tweet that he had uh, just maybe last week or a couple of days ago. But, Neff, before we get into the match uh, quotes, I just have a small question for you one more time now. Alex shared a uh, tweet to us, what was it, yesterday or today in the morning about how Austin had a very Atletico de Madrid kind of match. And sometimes you just have to bunker down and really just hope that you get that point and hopefully you get that goal in transition, that goal in, in counterattack. But don't answer it. We're going to come back to that point here. But I just wanted to mention before that I did, did forget. But did Austin put on a Atletico de Madrid kind of display against Seattle. We're going to come back to that. Now, uh, some quotes here from Josh Wolf. We're going to start off with him. He says this, and this is from Eric Goodman. He asked the question. He was uh, he got first dibs in the press conference uh, for Austin FC, and it wasn't that many folks, so shout out to the people that did uh, stick around. We heard Eric Goodman's voice. We heard Phil West's voice. Michelle Sanchez was also there, uh, just to name a few. Uh, but uh, Wolf says this, it's important to know you come to Seattle missing some guys, certainly. It's a tough place to play. Historically, one of the best teams at home, one of the best teams in the league. It's always going to be a grind. And we've done really well here. I think three wins and a tie. I think he's off a little bit on his stats, but he was pretty close. He also says, it doesn't matter what you think the game will look like, what you come to grips with. It's going to be a struggle. Whether you win the game or tie the game, guys are going to have to grind, put their body on the line. They're going to have to suffer and sacrifice. I think that was on display tonight. It was a really... Uh, it was a really good character point for our group. He also says, I'm not too worried about coming to Seattle and not outpossessing or outperforming Seattle in their own field. They're a good team, one of the best in the league. We've come here a number of times and probably outshot every time. When you come here, you got to land your punches. In the last 15 minutes, there were some transition opportunities. He finishes with this. He says, the guys will feel, the guys will feel good about the point. We'll be able to have a good week of training again and look forward to a spirited game against St. Louis. Now, Matt Hedges, he says, quote, I thought the back line, Brad Stuver, and even the guys in front of us, like Johan Valencia, did a fantastic effort. This is one of the toughest places in the league to come get a point and a shutout. I'm very proud of the work we put in tonight. They had some chances, but I thought we defended well. Matt Hedges, very proud of the defensive effort that his team put out. Josh Wolf. Happy to leave Lumen Field with a point. I know a lot of Austin FC fans, I put myself in there. Also in the fact that I'm happy with the point leaving Lumen Field. But Neff, uh, your thoughts on what Joshua had to say, what I just read right now to you, and if you'd like to comment on what Matt had just said also. Soft mentality, brother. And, and I'm going to tell you why, because you and I, you know, as observers of the game, it's one thing, right? We can say this, we can say that. And as a fan, you can say, yes, I'm happy with the point. A professional going to a press conference and saying, we're happy with the point, especially with such a weakened Seattle team, that's where the soft mentality comes in. Because as a professional, you cannot be telling your fans, the ones that, that cheer you on literally no matter what, you're kind of giving them the message that, you know, yeah, we're this is this is the most we can achieve. And but even then, even then, if to those supporters that that you're talking about, though, can you not say, hey, at least Austin FC didn't lose against Seattle? We 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 mentioned 23 shots. It could have been three, four nil, but the team didn't lose. The team gets a point. They go back to Austin with a very valuable point. The fans can. Absolutely, the fans can. But having sure, that a mentality sure. as a professional, and mind you, of course, I'm no professional. But I've I've 
lit I've seen enough of this sport and I and I've seen so many different mentalities of so many different clubs and I can tell you this no team that goes in and finishes a game happy with a tie wins much and and, and that's just from my observations what I've seen what I've lived you you know me very well Hernan I hate losing even pickup games I'm not saying that I'm right having that type of mentality, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying I'm a great, a big winner, but I will always go for it regardless. And that's what these guys should be doing. And that's the, the that's the attitude. Not oh yeah, we leave we leave Seattle with a point, but hey, injuries are not on our side. I think that's that's kind of a load of of uh, crap. Now, Neff, you do mention a week in Seattle side, and they were very weak. Uh, well, just on, on paper, they had a pretty good showing against Austin, but they had Reed Baker out of a hamstring. They had Stephen Fry, their, excuse me, Stephen Fry, their goalkeeper, out on a hamstring injury. Jamar Gomez, out, uh, not due to injury. Nathan, not due to injury, but he was still out. João Paulo, his hip kept him out of this game. Braudilio Rodriguez, hamstring out. Albert Rusnak, ankle out. And Raul Ruiz, he was labeled as questionable, but he comes on for Pedro de la Vega and almost wins it, right? Great technique. I think nine out of ten times he scores that, but this was that tenth time, and it hit the crossbar. And thankfully for that crossbar, Austin FC leaves Lumenfield with a golden point. Golden, and I even say that we stole it from Lumenfield. That's what I labeled the uh, Twitter space. It might be the name of this podcast, a point stolen in Seattle, because genuinely, that's what it feels like. But hey... I I'll take the point. I I will take the point 100. You know, we 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 stole a point from Lumen, in my opinion. Uh, on the on the tweet that I put out saying, "Hey, it's okay to be happy with the point. Hey, it's okay to be very critical of this team." You know, the fact of the matter is that we leave Lumen point. We leave Lumen field with a point. And I hate to say it, but not a lot of teams are going to leave Lumen field with a point this season. And the fact that Austin FC was able to leave with one, I I I'm happy with that. And I'm not over the moon with it. I'm not over the moon with it. I'm not okay with it. I'm not going to say, hey, this is what I expect week in, week out. But the situation that we're in, the energy maybe that we left Minnesota with, you know, Josh Wolf says that we had a, a good second half against Minnesota, but the, the, the game is 90 minutes. Um, you know, it, everything leading into this game was not necessarily 100% against us, Neff, but it wasn't set for us to win. If you look at the predictions going into this game, Nobody had Austin FC winning it in the first place. So the fact that we get a draw, because it was nil-nil, I think that's what really stains it, the attacking display. But the fact that we didn't break, we just bent, the center backs put in a great showing, I'm happy with the point leaving them in field. There are individual performances that I'm very frustrated with, and I will talk about Emmy right now after this. But other than that, the point, I'm okay with it. Anything you want to add, bro? Yes, one first. There wasn't a stolen point because Austin didn't do anything to steal it. It was Seattle lost the point, lost two points. They left two points on the table, three, two points on the table. That's, That's fair. That's fair. First point. The second point is, lost my train of thought, but essentially, really, it's just you, you can't, you just, you can't go into games like that. You can't. That's fair. Oh, That's fair. Here, here's where it was good. The, more, more teams will get a point at Seattle, but they will do it against a better se- a Seattle team, a healthier Seattle team. That's and that's true. where you have to that's be true. critical of your of your of your team and realize that, man, they had all these guys out. It, because even if they're depth players, those players probably would have gone in and made a made some type of impact. But other teams are going to have to face a stronger Seattle team to get a tie. And when they do, then then what are you going to say about this, this Austin performance? It's like, damn. Austin just stood there and took it and still couldn't. Nah, bro. It's just... Now, now Nef, some, some questions moving forward. Uh, I wanted to ask about Drew C, of course, because we have St. Louis coming up next. We can kind of get into the preview now of, on St. Louis. Now, the question I have for you, and I'll, I'll answer it myself first before I pass it on to you. And the question is this. Uh, when Drusy comes back, will this team get better? How influential is he to this team? I mean, that second part of the question is kind of irrelevant. We know how important he is to this team. But when Drusy comes back, is this team going to get better? Now, I think so. 
I really do think so because we finally see what Josh Wolf was talking about with the emphasis on the defense and, and you know, preseason, offseason, how they were working for that, right? But when Seba comes back, my train of thought right now is we're finally getting our defense in line. Gascant is finally performing. Matt Hedges is, is finally performing. Brad Stuber has been doing his thing. But we're looking defensively at least maybe sound in this game against the Seattle Sounders. We put on a good performance when you're talking about defense-wise. Now, if Seba comes in and gets the attack on check, in check, and we combine that with our defensive unit finally being on par with our attack when Seba comes in because he changes us 100%, we might have a different story moving forward. I know our schedule is, is very difficult coming up uh, ahead for Austin FC. But when you insert Seba with the defense that's finally starting to click and work together, I think things can change for Austin FC, mate. Now, I pass it on to you. You know, maybe I sound a little bit optimistic, but I think when Seba comes back, this team elevates levels to where they're at right now. So what do you think? I think you go over the moon speaking levels. Uh, does the team get better? Yes, it gets better because it's it's juicy, right? Does it get levels better? No, 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 no. And 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 here's here's part of that. You're gonna see next game if Juicy comes back, where Valencia is gonna sit on the bench, and then you're gonna see this defense exposed yet again. And, and it's back to the point that I told you earlier. The defense looked good because they had an extra man in Valencia cutting and destroying those key passes. That's okay, the now, thing right there. Juicy can quick, yeah. make the, the the forward line better, but it, it's not going to do much. Now, uh, before I make a counterpoint, if you could turn off your camera and turn it back on for me, you froze on my screen. But you mentioned Valencia. Now, is there a perfect world where we can have Drusi on the field along with Valencia? You know, Valencia doing the job that he did against Seattle, like you mentioned, and Drusi doing his duties moving forward as the center attack in mid that really is the, the whole creativity for this offense. I don't know because we've rarely seen it before. But I'd be very interested to see if Josh Wolf sees the importance of Valencia against Seattle and hopefully tries to implement that in future matches coming up. Because I agree with you 100%. Valencia was very influential and key in the fact that we got to secure the point against Seattle. And I don't want to see him go back to the bench. No, 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 no. In fact, I'm a little, I don't want to say disappointed, but I'm, I'm just a little bit like taken back at how poor Danny looked against Seattle. And how poor he looked against Minnesota. Now, you could say maybe he's in a different position. Josh Wolf is trying to move him around or whatnot. But Danny, you know, he's a little bit of a shadow of what he was last season. And and, and I know that's not permanent. I know he's going to come back to the level where he's all, he's used to have, to being at. But as of right now, I mean, the, the, the midfield, not even Alex Ring. Nobody is a lock-in starter. The only name that I have on my team sheet, two names moving forward, is Drusy when he's healthy, of course. And we don't know if he'll be healthy against St. Louis. But Valencia, just like you said, I, th I think he was very influential, very important for the team, and I'd like to see him play for Austin FC moving forward, 100%, 100%. Now, uh, another question that I had, Neff, is what's going to happen with Rigoni this season? Because it's his last season on a guaranteed contract. Uh, I believe after it is the club's option to see if they want to extend him or not. But it's just been a poor, poor, poor showing by him. I mean, the situation with Ring, they look like they're not clicking at all. Those are two of our DP players. I mean, without Drusy, those are two main guys, the ones we're going to look to to make a difference in the game. Maybe more Rigoni than Ring because he's more of attacking uh, characteristics. But my day, Rigoni is just just not on the level that this team needs him to be at. And with all due respect, I cannot wait until the contract runs out so we can really put that money to use because it was a failed experiment. All due respect, it was a failed experiment. And any contributions that he did for Austin FC, you know, thank you for that. But this season can't can end soon enough to see that contract run out, honestly. And and I think I speak for a lot of Austin FC fans out there how they've just been so disappointed with Emmy in the not even the start of these two games, just last season as well, the season before that. You know, really since he's gotten to Austin FC, he's never really been comfortable. And you can go back to the success he had, what was it last year, where he scored what five or six goals, if I'm not mistaken. He looked good maybe as a number nine. But other than that, bro, I mean Emmy, I mean, five, six goals, that's what we're limiting our DP players to? That's not good enough in this league. Just not good enough at all. So, Neff, any thoughts on Emmy before we talk about St. Louis? You know, as I've said before, no disrespect that, uh, to him personally, he's just not. 
there's there's a term uh, that they use a lot in uh, in Spain, and it's uh, now translated as a former player. And this guy plays like he's already playing those classic games, those those mm. charity matches. Like it's just mm. it's appalling to see. Oh, that's so harsh there, mate. But I hey, kind of pretty give out honestly, but because Emmy has just been underwhelming for Austin MC and. Like I said, I hope to, nobody takes this the wrong way, but it's just sports reality. It's just business, and Emmy has not held up his his side of the bargain based off what he's being paid, the kind of the role that he has for this team. DP players have to be a hit, and he has been a miss a hundred percent. I cannot spin it any way, any shape or fashion. Emmy Rigoni, I'm sorry, brother, but you have to go soon. Hopefully, you find a club, but it it, it can't be in Austin. It just cannot be. And maybe that's what Rodo Borrell was I talking about. When he says, just, just super quick. Maybe that's what Rodo Borrell was talking about when he says the the, the mess that he in, inherited and, and when he arrived at Austin MC was just truly remarkable. But go ahead, man. I have I have a conspiracy theory that you believe in the butterfly effect, do you? Yes. Yes. I believe if Rigoni doesn't get to Austin FC. Austin FC could have been at least in the MLS final <laughs> that year. I, I genuinely believe it. If you look at the stats, and they've been pointed out by Jorge Iturralde on Club Deportes, and he was criticized for it, but he put out Emir Rigoni's stats since arriving at Austin FC, how many goals we were scoring before and after. And it's, it's, in, it's, in, it's in black and white, ladies and gentlemen. It's right there for everybody to interpret. It's stats. I cannot... I cannot give false narratives with, with with stats and the numbers are there we're we're better when emmy is not on the pitch and it sucks to say it it's no disrespect to him at all but he's just not that guy now if we could please move forward to the st louis predictions mate uh we play them uh if i'm not mistaken they're, they're our next opponent right let me just double check before i give the fans false yeah, information yeah, so. yes yes okay so march 9th st louis comes to q2 stadium in austin texas now before they uh, have to play us. They've also played New York City FC. They beat them yesterday 2-0. New York City FC had a red card, of course. They've also played against Ross Salt Lake, where they drew 1-1. That was fe- uh, February the 24th. I'm sorry, sure that's their MLS uh, opener. But they also have two more games that Austin FC has not played this season, and that's in CCC, the CONCACAF Champions Cup. They beat Houston Dynamo 2-1 on February the 20th. And then on February the 27th, they lost the Dynamo one nil so austin fc is definitely coming into this game fresher with uh more rested legs now if drusi comes back i think austin fc has a bit of a chance against st louis but without sebastian drusi the chance is out the door and we're probably going to see another seattle kind of match where it's like hey bunker down and hope that cascante valencia and matt hedges has another you know just monumental performance like i said because it can be world class but monumental uh any predictions on your side net for the st louis match not any pretty ones no um i just don't see austin getting this one i don't see it um st louis has good de- depth uh and mm-hmm. even austin at home i just it, it's hard to see because you gotta remember juicy's going to be coming off of an injury so he won't be necessarily 100% right away and so you know the way with the type of game that Louis St. Louis plays I just it's, it's very hard for me to see it even if if Austin decides to to box up and stay in in on their half of the field it's just it'll be very hard for me to predict an Austin win uh, I think best case scenario, it's another Seattle Tech game, like you said, and maybe a draw. Now, it is important to note that Josh Wolf did not confirm 100% that Juicy is back against St. Louis. You know, they're still taking it day by day, seeing how he feels, you know, what he's looking like. He has been training uh, maybe by himself, but, uh, you know, Josh Wolf said that uh, he's not 100% ready to go against St. Louis, and it's not confirmed if he's ready to go against St. Louis. So, before we say, oh, you know, it, this game is going to be different because Drusi is going to be there. We could have another Seattle match, just like we said, without Sebastian Drusi. Uh, maybe we see Noel. <laughs> maybe we see Noel, Neff. But uh, as of right now, if Drusi doesn't play, 
Uh, I see another draw. If if not, St. Louis takes the three points away from Q2 Stadium, and we're going to have another rowdy fan reactions. Uh, and it's not going to get a little easier because, you know, other than St. Louis, we have Philadelphia come in to Q2. We have to travel to Orlando City, play them, although they just took a beating with uh, Inter-Miami 5, what was it, 5-1, five, 5-0, five, no, something like that. Anyways, uh, we still also have to play FC Dallas in this month in, in March. And that's a Texas Derby. It's going to be a hard-fought battle. But things do not get easier for Austin FC. So I'm predicting a draw or a loss if we don't have Sebastian Drusi. The only way this team wins is with Sebastian Drusi at the wheel. The captain has to be back. He's our Pedro de la Vega. Any shape or form, he has to be on the field for Austin FC to be successful. It is what it is. Now, St. Louis recently played New York City FC with a 4-4-2. You know, it's going to be interesting to see if we adapt to that lineup, how we're going to, you know, present our plan, what kind of tactical... Um, uh, what kind of tactical plan, I guess, we're going to have against St. Louis. And hopefully it's a, it's it's something that works because uh, multiple fans say this. The league has this figured out week in and week out. People out coach us. Teams come in and do what they want at Q2. So hopefully uh, we get uh, Drusy Dior back, but we'll see what happens. Neff, uh, your score prediction. Uh, 3-0 St. Louis. <sighs> no, not, not like that. Two to one. Two to one, one nil. It can't be three nil at home. It cannot happen. No, nope. no way. If no it way. helps, I hope I'm wrong. I hope so too. <laughs> I hope so too, mate. Now, uh, Neff, before we go into the European segment, we're gonna chat a little bit about what happened in uh, Spain with Real Madrid and Valencia. You know, one one popular topic, of course, in Austin FC fan base is the Wolf House situation. Um, I mean, if we don't perform, if Austin FC doesn't perform in the next five matches or so, I mean. Wolf came into the season in the hot seat, according to some national media pundits. Not very much for Rodo Borrell and the ownership, but for the fan base, he's been in the hot seat for years, I guess. And, I mean, do you see him maybe being out this season based off the poor start that Austin FC had so far in 2024? Of course, a, a golden point, but if we're being real, it has been a poor start for Austin. Wooden uh, spoon contenders. Yeah. Wooden spoon contenders. Oh, absolutely. Uh that being said, look, I've been extremely critical of Wolf for a while now. And I don't see them getting rid of him if they didn't already. Mm-hmm. So that being said, for for the sake of this club and this team, because they're different, I hope I do hope he gets shown the door sooner rather than later. With that being said, though, the problems don't start or end at Wolf. I mean, you still have a very bad roster. And, you know, nothing, like I said, nothing personal against the guys, but Wolf is a start. And okay. when you start, then you have quite a bit of bullet points to get through. Now, Neff, just real quick, some quick news that uh, we do want to brush up on before we get into the European talk is the Open Cup news that we received um, Pretty much, this is what it is. Austin FC 2, FCTO, will represent Austin FC in the U.S. Open Cup in the 2024 season. Now, it is important to note that it was a league decision. It was not up to the club at all, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that needs to be said. That needs to be known 100% because there was a lot of attacks on the FO, on the ownership and whatnot. But there was a league decision to send um, Austin FC 2 to the U.S. Open Cup to represent the organization. Now, there were some MLS teams that... Uh, did get selected to send their first teams. Those are Atlanta, Dallas, the Dynamo, which is the defending champion, LAFC, Rasa Lake, San Jose, the Seattle Sounders, and SKC. They're sending their MLS teams to the Open Cup. But the MLS Next Pro teams that Austin FC, Austin FC 2 falls into, uh, like I said, MCTO, Carolina Core, Chattatunga FC, Chicago Fire 2, the Colorado Rapids 2, Crown Legacy, their Charlotte's team, Minnesota United FC 2, LA Galaxy 2, New York City FC 2, New York Red Bulls 2, and the Portland Timbers 2. Those are the teams, the next pro affiliates that will be playing the next pro uh, cup. Now, later on, we did get more news where it's this. It says, Austin MC2 will face off against Foro FC in the first round of the U.S. Open Cup on Tuesday, March 19th at 8 p.m. Central Time. The game will be held at Palmer Field. Now, that's via U.S. Soccer. You can check it out at ussoccer.com. So, we get information, confirmation that the 
game that Sito will play is going to be at Palmer Field. Now, I cannot wait for that atmosphere. I know that there's going to be some boycott, some protesting maybe going on. Um, as people that cover this team, you know, we're going to be there to try to capture the atmosphere, try to capture the analysis of the game. We're going to, we're thinking about doing fan reactions after. So um, I'm with everybody that's very upset about the U.S. Open Cup decision. Uh, but, you know, as media, as uh, people that cover this team, I feel like we have to be there. So uh, we're going to see what the fans that are there say about the decision to get FC to in the cup. But hopefully we talk about a win after that game. But we'll see. Now, Nef, uh, we're, we we reached an hour on Lost in FC content. Now we can get into the European segment, the side of things. Now, we mentioned the Manchester Derby. We were watching that game uh, earlier today in the morning, watching it with Eric and some more critic and everybody that was on Discord. Uh, shout out to Tucker, who was just laughing at Holland for missing a chance right in front of the goal. But later on, he gets his... Uh, City won it 3-1. to one. They beat Man United. United was up 1-0. Rashford had a fantastic goal, but it was not going to be held on. We knew City was going to come back. But the main thing that I want to talk about here tonight in the last couple of minutes that we have on the podcast is the Real Madrid-Valencia situation. Like I said earlier, it made the rounds all over the world. It got to Pat McAfee for crying out loud, and he made a tweet about it. But pretty much, I said earlier, the robbery of the century. You know, maybe it's a little bit exaggerating, but it was just blatant robbery what we saw by referee Gil Manzano, a guy that I know has received a lot of criticism in the past, but I didn't think he was that bad before this game. After this game, my opinion on him changes 100%, and I hope there's investigation that goes into it. Um, but we see that when Brahim Diaz receives the ball late in the match, in that play that everybody knows what I'm talking about, the whistle goes to his mouth. He takes it away. The ball is in the air, and he blows the whistle. Jude Bellingham gets a header on it, puts it into the back of the net. At that point, it's 3-2 for Real Madrid, a comeback win, another remontada for Los Blancos. But Gil Manzano says, game over. 2-2, it's done. Uh, what was your thoughts, Nev? Shame. Lots and lots of shame because I don't know that this has ever happened in football history. It's a, it's a lot. It's a lot of years of history to go through. But it's shameful that that a ref, an international ref, nonetheless, who is supposed to be the best ref in Spain, which is what he was given this game specifically, ends the game in the way that he did. If you want to talk about signs of corruption and stuff like that, which I'm not accusing him of being corrupt, but I am going to accuse him of being shady as hell at the very least, because I've never seen a ref stop the play in with with the ball in the air in an obvious opportunity to goal. Never have I seen that. You and and you and I, we've both played the game. You don't stop on a clear opportunity at, at goal. You don't stop it there. That it. With that being said, that's extremely shameful. The red to Bellingham was also shameful. It's. I'm not gonna say much. I can't. I really just can't say anything more. I, I'm. La Liga really should be embarrassed because this is the product that they gave out to the world. This is La Liga. Now I've been a huge defender of La Liga for years. You know, and whenever Messi and Chris was there, uh, whenever they they were there, it was a lot easier to defend because a lot of eyes were there. You know, it was it, it, it was the league to watch. But now they're they're not there anymore, and you really have to kind of reach to find the qualities in this league. You know, right now, the dominant league, whether people like it or not, but it is the EPL. It is the best league in the world, 100%. I'm here to say it, right? But La Liga, they cannot have this kind of display and still try to call themselves one of the best leagues in the world because it's just disastrous. And and really, what I want to say, Neff, is I want to just send a shout out to the people that say that the league is dangerously prepared for Real Madrid. The folks that say that the refs are always on Real Madrid's side. The people that say that you know, Real Madrid's money. Florentino makes the call. Where was the call? Where was the money? Where was the help here? 
You know, it just shameful comments that people like to make against Real Madrid really just blew up in their face after this poor showing by Gil Manzano. It was in the Mestalla, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, it, it was there because Madrid had the purple. But it really just goes to show how how uneducated some of those comments are, to be very frank. And I really like to see... I, I hate the fact that Real Madrid was uh, involved in this situation, but I, I, I love to see those fans that accuse Madrid of corruption, you know, in, in the recent weeks in La Liga. Where was that corruption today? Where was that help? Where was that? It, it was not present. And of course, the comments aren't there anymore. Of course, the comments are shush, shush. People go back into their caves. But just goes to show, just goes to show how Madrid is not getting any help from these referees. And if anything, they're trying to stop Madrid from running away from this league. And and. As controversial, Neff, as scandalous as this game was, brother, um, it really didn't put that much of a dent in Real Madrid's title hope because they're still at 66 points. Girona in second place with 59, uh, Barcelona in third with 58, and Atletico de Madrid with 55. Madrid's still running away with it. But if they would have won this game, title hopes would have been pretty much over for everybody chasing Madrid. But of course, we get a scandalous performance by Gil Manzano, and you and I are talking about a robbery of the century today. But, I mean, is there anything else you want to add on this on this game, Mev, before I talk about the muchachas de la Selección Mexicana? Uh, look, it, it, it's, yes, it's shameful and all of that, but at the at the end of the day, we also, we also have to be critical of our team, right? Because this whole situation arrives from two huge mistakes at the back from our team. True. True, we true. we we gifted those goals to them, and we put ourselves in that position. So, uh, as far as criticism for my team, I will have criticism for my team for allowing uh, to go two goals down at the way they did. It it was just it was horrible. But but the the difference is it, it's just it's just disgusting. It really is, and and just like you said to those about those fans, I want to see I want to see their reaction when if if that ever happens to them, if they ever get the the whistle blown on them the way it was on us, because a lot of them just love to, love to talk shit just because it's Madrid, a taste of our own medicine. But you know what? At the end of the day, we didn't pay rent for twenty years. And we're not preparing. We don't, obviously don't have any any benefit of doing so if that was the case. So, uh, and in regards to say, that's all I have to say on that. You're good, man. We don't gotta spend much more time on this absolutely atrocious performance by Gil Manzano. Um, now, I do want to send a shout out to Leverkusen in the Bundesliga. Shout out to Xavi Alonso. Ten points clear of Bayern Munich. Really looks like they're gonna win that league. Uh, a, a gaffer, a coach that is really just uh, impressing so many people worldwide. And I didn't know Xavi Alonso had that in him. I knew he was going to be good. I knew he was going to do good at, in the Bundesliga. But to lead Bayern Munich by 10 points, you know, kind of taking it from their hands. We know how how locked the Bundesliga trophy is for Bayern Munich. But Leverkusen, shocking the entire world. So credit to Xavi Alonso and Leverkusen out there. But Nick, before we end the pod... Um, I want to send a shout out to the Selección Mexicana Femenil because they pulled out a massive result against the U.S. Women's National Team in the Gold Cup is currently, currently going on right now. Now, they beat uh, Paraguay 3-2. to two. Keeper had a masterful performance. I think saved the penalty, if I'm not mistaken, as I was seeing on that, uh, uh, social media. But the USA game, now, what a performance by those girls. Now, the goals that were, that were scored, people were comparing the first goal to uh, Giovanni Dos Santos' goal against the USA in the Gold Cup years ago. We were both kids when that happened. I remember that day like yesterday. And they were down 2-0 and they came back 4-2. to two, And Gio scored probably the be- one of the best goals in Mexican soccer history, se- uh, selección-wise. But uh, goals by Lisbeth Ovalle and Mayra Pelayo lifted Mexico to a stunning 2-0 win over the U.S. Women's National Team. Uh, Monday in the final group play of the CONCACAF Women's Gold Cup in front of a crowd of 11,000 at Dignity Health Sports Park. Um, this is interesting. This win was just the second for Mexico against the USA in 43 games, the first coming nearly 14 years ago in Cancun, and the result was well-deserved, uh, 100%, as you could say. But just wanted to give them a little bit of praise because, you know, like I said, it, this kind of result doesn't happen 
And as much as I want my daughter to play for the U.S. Women's uh, National Team, I got to send a shout out to Las Muchachas de la Selección Mexicana, mate. I mean, do you, do you want to send them any uh, praise their way? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the the women's sport is growing day by day and it really year is. by year. So. It really is. Yeah. And so it, it's nice to see that there's a that that the Mexican national team, uh, women's national team, has has gotten a result. The U the women's the U.S. national team for the women's is has been a standard of football um in its division for as long as it has for a reason uh, i know it's starting to decline a little bit but uh, i'm glad to see um you know i'm glad to see them being able to stand up to it now before we end the pod and if i forgot to mention how my chivas de guadalajara got destroyed by chris azul uh, this weekend three nil interesting result didn't deserve to lose like that uh but we move as we say here in Austin. Now, Liga MX standings, Monterrey is in first place. Cruz Azul is in second. They're tied for first, actually. Uh, Alex's football critics, Pachuca, he says, Salomón Rongoat, which is a very funny little nickname there. They're in third place. America, uh, Brian and all these teams, they're in fourth. Toluca, Tigres, Pumas, Necaxa, and then Chivas, ninth place. Still in the playoff picture. And then Querétaro, León, and San Luis. Santos, now if you're Santos, just barely missing out of the playoff picture, but there's still more games to go, so we'll see what happens. I mean, anything you want to mention on Liga? Oh, man, look, if if any Austin FC fans wants to to see what a struggling, mediocre team can do just changing their coach for a proper one, Santos is a, is, is a great team to follow in that aspect. Nacho Santos just... Nacho Ambriz is fine. Like he has his four games in. Last the previous two uh, have turned up as as wins, and the mm-hmm. team is with the same players. It's looking so much better, more solid. Mm. Look, I'm just saying, there's hope for teams that want that want to have it, and some teams kind of want to win and some others kind of don't so so maybe well, some soft mentality there hey will bruin chill out that's what i'm gonna call you from now on will bruin neff bruin that's that's your new nickname but uh everybody thank you for sticking around with us for another episode of top flight pod we talked Austin FC against seattle we were very critical and you know i guess maybe you can say that we're Happy with the point. I know I am. Uh, you know, we mentioned the European talk. Shout out to Las Chicas de la Selección Mexicana. Europe robbery in El Mestalla. And, of course, we ended here tonight with Liga MX chat. But I'm Hernan, your host. Shout out to my Ginef for being here tonight. And we look forward to speaking to you all here soon. We got St. Louis coming up next. Fan reactions will be there 100%. And we're almost back in studio. I thought we would be back this weekend, y'all. But promise we'll be back. We'll be in there next week. So stay tuned for that. I want everybody to see it. Can't wait. And uh, we'll see you soon. Uh, Have a good night, everybody. Be safe.